Good morning and welcome to Harvest Fellowship. We welcome those of you who are here in person and those viewing on the live stream today. We uh, are grateful that you are with us. We have reached the end. It's the last Sunday of 2020. And many of us are grateful to see that year in our rearview mirror. But I think if you take stock of what's happened this year, we can realize that this has been a year where maybe we have learned to trust the Lord in all new ways, to deepen our relationship with Him, to put our trust in Him, because there were other things that we used to trust in that we cannot trust in any longer. And so we come to the end of a difficult year and we stand looking forward into the beginning of a new year, praying, expecting, hoping to see God continue to draw us in and to bring us deeper and deeper into fellowship with Him. He's a holy God. He's a just God. He is a true God. We can rely on Him. And so we come together to worship Him this morning. Would you stand with me for our call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Tell of all His wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let's pray. Father, we do look back and we see how you have worked even in the midst of difficulty and we rejoice. Father, we pray that you would give us strength to tell the people of your deeds that your holiness your goodness, your justice, your love, and your grace would be made known in our lives, in our community, and in our world. And as we gather to worship you this morning, may we set our hearts on that truth and lift up your name and give you all the glory, honor, and praise that you are due. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Oh. 
as we will be when he comes. like to end by going back to that third verse, the second half, that last slide we just sang. And the reason why is because the fourth verse ends with, I stand. And I feel like you can't end with me. The story isn't me. The story is the precious blood of Christ. What Scott prayed this morning and what our call to worship was is that we would tell each other about God's might and about his mysteries and about what he's done. And we sang that in these songs this morning. Go back and look at them. The first one, the song of the angels in Revelation, holy, holy, holy. And then come behold the wondrous mystery tells the gospel. And this last song in Christ alone gives our hope. 
we stand. We stand, but only washed in the precious blood of Christ. Please have a seat. With those truths ringing in our minds, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, indeed, you are the holy, holy, holy God. We are impressed this morning as we come to the end of one year and and stand on the brink of a new year that from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands our destiny. That there's no power of hell, no scheme of man that can ever pluck us from his hand. No coronavirus, no political movement, no quarantine or isolation, no restriction on how often or how many can meet, can separate us from your love, Father, because you established your love for us and you showed it by purchasing us with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we look back and we praise you for the good work that you have done in this church and in all of your church throughout 2020. You've brought us a new pastor, and we are grateful for Barry and his family being here to minister to us, to lead us, to shepherd us. We're thankful for new members who joined our church just this fall for new technology that allows us to live stream our service and include many who otherwise couldn't participate. And we are grateful, Lord, for sustaining us throughout this year, throughout the uncertainty and the uneasiness. You have held us together and kept us strong and given us the opportunity to love you and to love one another. And so we pray for the new year coming up, that you would continue to bless our church, that you would give us opportunities to serve you and each other and our community, that we as a congregation would see you uphold our mission to love you to love people, and to make disciples. We pray particularly for our children's ministry and the Diapers to Diplomas Committee as they continue to monitor the effects of the COVID and to make decisions about Sunday school and and other children's activities. Father, thank you for these creative and energetic people who love our youngest members and want to see them ministered to and nurtured in the faith. We pray that you would provide openings and ideas to do just that. We pray for our state and for the officials of Maryland as they continue making decisions regarding COVID. We pray that they would be dependent upon you, O Lord, steadfast in prayer and looking to you for wisdom. We thank you that despite many of the other restrictions that uh, You have laid it on their heart to uphold religious freedoms and allow gatherings like this so that we might worship you. And Father, as we look outward from ourselves, we lift up one of our missionary families this morning, Satoshi and Callie, ministering in Europe. You know their situation, Lord. You know that they're in an area that's prone to protests and terrorist attacks, and so we pray for their safety in the midst of that. We pray that 
you'd give them the ability to know how to minister to the people around them in the midst of difficult circumstances. We pray that they would be keenly aware of your presence and your grace as they do this. And Father, we pray also this morning for the unreached people group of the Hadrami in Yemen. Yemen is one of the most hostile places to you, to your name, and to the gospel in all of the world. And so we pray that you would draw this people group, the Hadrami, to yourself. We pray that any believers in nearby tribes would be able to reach out to them. There are likely no believers today among the Hadrami. We pray for peace in the country of Yemen. We pray for a stable and effective government that would rule with justice. We pray that you would settle the turmoil and dangers that are there and open a path for Christians not only to practice their faith, but to witness to others without the danger of having their lives taken that hangs over them today. We pray, Lord, that as you arrange these encounters between believers and the Hadrami, that your gospel would go out and that you would bring to yourself all that you would gather in. Now, Father, as we prepare to continue our worship, we pray that as a congregation, we would be a people of your word, spending time in it beyond just what we hear on Sunday morning, that we would treasure your word, that we would seek a deeper relationship with you through the reading of the scriptures. Father, we pray that you would use your word to deepen our faith and our love for you and to inspire and move us to reach out to those around us. We pray this morning for our guest preacher, Sterling Brown, as he brings your word to us, that you would strengthen him and enable him to speak your truth boldly. All of this we commit to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As I mentioned, we have a guest preacher. Our pastor Barry is present, but he's on his staycation and uh, another typical 2020 thing. And so we are grateful uh, to have uh, Sterling Brown come. Now, Sterling, if you look in your worship folder, he's listed as candidate under care. And you might be wondering, what is that? Well, in the PCA, when a man seeks uh, ordination as, as a minister of the word of God, he comes under the care of the presbytery in which he resides. And the presbytery oversees his education, his training, and his preparation for that. And that's where Sterling is. God has called him, and he is pursuing that call. And we are delighted, Sterling, if you would come now and bring the word to us this morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, as you know, my name is Sterling Brown, and uh, I, I live in Laurel, Maryland, with my wife and three daughters um, who are here today. Uh, my wife, Jasmine, uh, my daughter, Victoria, Chloe, and Scarlett. And um, Lord willing, I'll be graduating from RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary, this year in May. Uh, hopefully, if I can keep up the pace. And um, and uh, continue to uh, hang in there. So please keep me in prayer for that. And uh, thank you again so much for allowing us to uh, allowing us to come and share the word of God with all of you. Uh, one of the things I love about the Presbyterian uh, denomination is that th we're just one big family. So uh, we're always excited to come and spend time uh, with and visit other churches because uh, is, we look at it as uh, visiting our distant relatives. So thank you so much, and we uh, pray that we'll be a blessing to you, towards you, uh, to, to you today. Um, so the title of the sermon is Preparing for Advent, 
And some of you might be thinking like, oh boy, you're one of those guys who likes to keep the Christmas music playing after New Year's. And you're absolutely right, I do. <laughs> but uh, we want to think about um, preparing for Advent, preparing for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be in 1 Peter, and uh, this is a general epistle of the New Testament. It was written to Christian exiles who were uh, scattered abroad to encourage them in their faith in Christ. So we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. So if you want to turn your Bibles there. Um, and we see here that uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it reads, To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter wrote to encourage these Christians because they were undergoing persecution. Uh, now, there is no mention of Christians dying in this letter or Roman emperors searching out Christians uh, worldwide to kill or imprison them like Nero or Domitian. Peter is ref often refers to the Christians suffering for doing good or trying to hold on, fa hold fast to their faith. According to the language of the letter, Christians are suffering local persecution from those around them. The recipients of the letter were referred to as the elect exiles of the dispersion. And these Christians were colonists chosen by Rome to colonize areas such as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Asia. Some were willing to go, but others were not and were displaced unwillingly. So Peter's letter is not to a local church, but is a cyclical letter to be read abroad. And the area that Peter's letter would cover would be equivalent to the size of California. So many of the first colonists to be cho chosen would be citizens of uh, would be non-citizens of Rome. They would be troublemakers in Rome's eyes, and they are those who question the Roman morality. They tried to convert Roman citizens to their religion or would not pay tribute to the emperor as God. Or people who wanted to colonize with the hope of gaining citizenship. And there were also Roman veterans and citizens who would want to obtain a place of power and rule in a colony. So the group was certainly a mixed bag. A mixed bag. So the Christians were exiled to a foreign land within this group. And those in that land were hostile towards the Roman colonizing groups. So you had the colonists coming to colonize Rome, and then you had the people who were already there who were not too friendly to those coming to colonize. Then on top of that, the groups that the Christians were sent with were hostile towards them because they had a strong dis distaste for the way the Christians lived and how they glorified God. So the term diaspora often referred to Israelites who lived outside of Palestine. Although Peter used this term, the recipients of this letter were Gentile. Um, and we can see this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. It reads, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Also in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, it reads, For the time is past, that, that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So we can see that this doesn't really fit a Jewish audience because Israel um, did worship the one and true God, and they had... Uh, their lifestyle doesn't match this. So this letter seems to be written to Gentile Christians. So uh, this letter is also meant to encourage the Christian exile in the faith and to finish the race that is set before them by overcoming in and through Christ in the midst of unfavorable and challenging conditions. So with that said, let's pray. and We're going to read our text for today. Father, we come in the name of your Son and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to worship you as your gathered assembly to hear your holy, infallible, and errant word. 
May this blessed assembly tremble at your word and be captivated after Christ in our hearts. Father, we look forward at, to the second advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he will come on the clouds in all of his glory. We pray that he would come quickly and all the nations would bow before him and sin, Satan, and death will be no more. We look forward to the day where there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the holy city, the new Jerusalem, shall come down out of heaven. We look forward to the day where every tear will be wiped from our eyes. Death shall be no more, nor shall there be, be any more mourning, nor crying, pain, and the former things will have passed away. Father, we give you praise that all things are being made new, and we see this in salvation, in, 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 salvation, in our salvation, the new creation. And anyone who does not know you can come without payment to Christ by faith alone to drink from the water of life freely. And we pray that you would awaken others to do so. For we know that the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars will be thrown into the lake of fire and sent to an eternal perpetual death. Father, bless us this day to anticipate the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We know he is coming quickly for your words are trustworthy and true. Christ brings his reward with him and he shall repay everyone according to what he has done. And may we live in anticipation of that great and glorious day. And so we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, our text reads today, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So as you heard me say, Earlier, the title of the sermon is Preparing for Ad Advent, which you can probably tell from the prayer and today's date, I am referring to the second coming of Christ. And we as Christian exiles are waiting for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we want to answer today, how do we live in anticipation of the Lord's coming? In this letter to the church, Peter tells us how to live within the expectation of the second advent. First, we must prepare, then put aside. And second, we must hope and then persevere. Peter tells us what to do, prepare, and then how to do it, put aside. He says to hope. And then here's how to hope, persevere. These will be our points for today as we walk through Peter's exhortation to believers who are living in a tough 
an unstable time. All things are not going to continue as they are, right? We know that because who would have thought that the events that is happening now today would have, who would have believed that we would be all sitting here with masks on a year ago? The world, beloved, is in an unsustainable position and there is an apocalyptic change coming and it is headed towards us at fervent speed. And this eternal change event is the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He could come today at the second. That would be really nice. Or it could be from years from now, but we are, but one thing is for sure, we are closer to this great event than we ever have been. If there is one thing from this sermon that you should get is this, that Jesus Christ is coming back and we need to live in anticipation of that glorious event. If there's one thing you need to get from this sermon is that Jesus Christ is coming back and we need to live in anticipation of that glorious event. So here's the first point, prepare. Prepare your mind for the coming of Christ. First Peter 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this verse and passage of Scripture is tied to Peter's previous thought about the redemption that we have through Christ. Peter wrote with overwhelming joy about our regeneration. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter also was overwhelmed that this salvation that we have now, it was a mystery to the prophets who wrote, but now it has been revealed to us. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things that have been now announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So in our text today, Peter says that we have the redemption that was promised. And now, now we must prepare, put aside hope and persevere because we are on this side of redemption, of redemption, moving towards its glorious consummation. We're moving towards its completion. The next great event on the redemptive calendar is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. P Peter probably... Uh, Oh, sorry. When the Bible talks about the mind, oh, I, well, I'm skipping a lot, aren't I? Back up, rewind. <laughs> Peter says, um, Peter says that we must prepare, and actually, the word is a participle, and it is, and it is preparing meaning that we have to constantly keep doing this. Another translation would be to gird up the loins of your mind or to bring in the loose ends of your mind or heart. So what does Peter mean when he talks about the mind? When the Bible talks about the mind, it is referring not only to, an, to the intellect, but it includes the will and the affections. In our day, we often talk about the heart, and for some, that means the emotions. For others, it means the mind, and for others, the will. So we uh, separate what the Bible is referring to as the mind. 
However, the biblical writers would have understood the mind to be the whole man, the intellect, the will, the affections. And Peter probably had in mind as he was writing the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, which reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. There is the mind, the intellect, and with all your soul, there is the will, and with all your might, there is your, there is the, there is the, your affections. And these Christians, um, these Christians, these Christian exiles were ripped from their homes, from their churches, from their way of life. Their businesses was de were destroyed. They were surrounded by hostil hostility internally and externally. There was instability, uncertainty, and hostile opposition can wreak havoc on the mind, can it? And all that was happening all that was happening was disorienting and perplexing. They were probably asking, if God loves us, why is this happening? And this is why Peter referred to these Gentile Christians as the dispersion, a title for Israelites who were scattered abroad. He calls them to account, just as Moses did, to remember that God has not changed and that their redemption has not been lost despite unfavorable circumstances and despite that they were in a wilderness journey. When Moses addressed the people of God in Deuteronomy, he was preparing them to receive their inheritance. And here Peter is addressing the people of God and he is telling them to prepare to receive your inheritance. What is happening around them can make someone think that they are further from the promise of redemption. But Peter says, no, you are closer than you ever have been. Don't let your eyes deceive you. Walk by faith and not by sight. Be reminded of the God of your salvation. He has saved you. He is saving you. He will save you. And listen to how Peter finishes his thought in this verse. Therefore, preparing your minds for actions and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So being sober minded, there's the intellect, or be self-controlled, don't let fear and doubt and hatred have a foothold, for if it does, it will be easy for the world to control you. Then he says, set your hope fully. This could be translated, set your expectations to the end for which it was saved. Peter says, keep your will, your desire fixed upon the ultimate, complete salvation of God. And then he says, fix your expectation on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I know many of us are looking forward to 2021, but we've got to look beyond 2021. I pray that 20, the next year will be better than this. We don't know what we're going to face. So lock and fix your eyes on the coming of Jesus Christ. The turning of the page calendar does nothing for men's hearts. So here, the fixing of your expectation, here's the affection. Keep Christ as your greatest treasure. You have lost much, but no one can take Christ from you. And that's why pressures come, because they can't take Christ from you. They want to convince you to give him up on your own. They want to convince you to turn your back on him. Refuse. Refuse passionately. If you have Christ Everything that you've lost in this pandemic, maybe it's friendships, schooling, time. 
It is nothing compared to who you have as your greatest affection, and he is coming soon. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, he says, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded by faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. This is why in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. So by now, the exiles, as they are hearing these words from Peter, are saying, how are we to do this? Peter tells them, tells them how to be preparing their minds for the coming of Christ. He says, put aside. This is how you prepare your hearts, your mind. Put aside. Put aside the futile ways of your forefathers. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 19, it reads, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, According to each one's deeds, conduct, your, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without, spot, without blemish or spot. So Peter here tells the exiles how to prepare for the coming of Christ, that we, they, must put aside the ways of our forefathers. Now, this could be biological since these he could be referring to biological fathers since, according to Peter's address, these are more than likely Gentile Christians. They're first generation Gentile Christians and their parents' ways needed to be avoided and repudiated since Again, they are first-generation Christians. And perhaps Peter remembered the words of our Lord when he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So perhaps he was referring to, listen, I know what you've learned from your mom and dad and what they've passed on to you, but that is not going to help you. Now, while I do believe Peter was including biological fathers, I think he was aiming more at the Roman pagan traditions. Its power structure and way of life sanctioned and encouraged by its rulers. In this context, it is my conviction that Peter is referring to the Roman governing bodies that propagate the pagan way of life. Rome was the epitome of identity politics and pagan and anti-biblical practices. For instance, you were identified by your social class, such as wealth, education, family connections, and who you worked for. Some could buy citizenship and others could not. Hence, that's why some went to uh, go colonizing for Rome, because that would secure citizenship for them. If you are a citizen of Rome, you could vote. You would not receive degrading forms of punishment, such as flogging. You could appeal directly to Rome and the local jurisdiction did not have absolute authority over you. But... If you were not a citizen, you did not have many humane rights. One uh, writer, his name is Everett Ferguson, he's a professor of church history, he said this, identity groups in the ancient world were formed by neighborhoods, ethnic groups, and cities of origin went away from home, associations, occupations, and religious cults. Also, Rome's moral compass was corrupt it's full of adultery, homosexuality, brutal executions, such as 
crucifixion, gladiatorial games, slavery, emperor worship, and abortion and exposure for the children. And you might be saying, what's exposure? So when a child was not accepted into the family when it was born, uh, it was not accepted into the family until after it was born unless the father approved of him or her being part of the family. And if the father did not approve of the child being accepted as part of the family, then the child would be exposed. What they would do is they would take the infant and lay it on the trash heap to die. And some slave traders would come by and pick the child up, and if it was a girl, they would be made to serve as a prostitute later, or if it was a man, if it was a boy, they would be a slave. And these were all practice, and those practices extended from the center to the cities and colonies. So the immorality of Rome came from their idolatry, the worship of false gods and emperors. And Everett Ferguson again says, this religion was closely interwoven with society in the Greco Roman world. It was official and part of the civil order. Each city had its patron deity or deities. Temples were built out of public funds and taxes were levied for the support of certain cults. The state decided expeditions for the cult and derived income from it. Images of the emperor and sanctuaries for the imperial cult were set up in the sacred precincts of the civic cult, meaning in the city and the way of life. The important cults were those joined to the emperor and national god. The other old cults that were rejected were declined. They declined. So the thought of the day during the empire was that the emperor is your father and Rome is your mother. Give a pinch of incense to honor your father and support your mother by supporting and upholding her teachings. Here is the words of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. He says, that which is not in the interest of the hive cannot be, cannot be in the interest of the bee. So remember, these Christians have been exiled from their homes to go with a group of willing and eager participants to colonize for Rome. And that means these Christians were encouraged to support Rome, Roman occupation and culture and the land that they were sent but Peter tells these Christian exiles, in order to prepare their minds for the coming of Christ, they must put aside the ways of their forefathers. They cannot think like Rome. They can't talk like Rome. They can't worship like Rome. They can't practice an immoral life like Rome. These are futile ways from your forefathers. You're not like to be you're 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 not to be like the emperor, but like God, your father, by being set apart and sacred for his use. Listen to what Peter says. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And beloved, this is what it means to do good in a society, is to live out being the holy nation that God called you to be. To submit to God as father and be obedient children to him. Peter says that the conduct of Christians should be with fear. He is saying it is better to fear God and live righteously and receive God's favor and pleasure rather than, rather than to fear men and live unrighteously and receive God's displeasure. There is no comparison. Fear God rather than men. And why? Well, 
You can purchase temporary status, security, and a fleeting life from Rome with silver and gold. However, you cannot purchase eternal life. It was purchased for you by something far more valuable, which is the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, God's Son. So here Peter is alluding to that glorious truth of the gospel, our adoption. There are many different aspects to the gospel of Christ. The main one we think of is the removal of God's wrath, and rightfully so, but, there's, but there is redemption bought from the slave market of sin. There is washing. We were dirty, but now clean. There is forgiveness. There is justification and removal of all charges against us. And then there is adoption, and the exiles would have understood this perfectly because adoption in Roman society was a frequent transaction that brought with it a new family, a new name, old debts paid for, new relationships and inheritance, discipline and liability and support from for the new child from the new child uh, for the new child from the father and beloved that is the gospel Aunt Peter is telling the exiles he says unlike the vicious fathers that are in Rome you have a good father and he would never leave you on the trash heap he picked you up and redeemed you and cleansed you from your for, for, former ways and where is Peter getting this from? Well, he's still focusing on the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. After the word says to love the Lord your God with your entire mind, heart, soul, and so God goes on to say this. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. In him you shall serve, him you shall serve and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy, destroys you from, from off the face of the earth. Then in Proverbs, after it says to keep your heart, the people are directed to put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. And beloved, this was no easy task for the Christian exiles. Try to, let's try to put our, uh, let's try to walk in their shoes a little bit because, um, because to live holy lives will place them at odds with the society around them. In addition to being in a strange land, they will risk being mistreated by the colony members. They will be put to shame for such living. And Peter understood this, and he says, you must not place your hope in the state, but in God. And that brings us to our next point. It says, place all your hope in the God of your salvation. First Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, he says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So living contrary to, Roman way, to the Roman way of life disrupted the peace of Rome. To live in opposition of the status, to live in opposition of the status quo would bring shame and dishonor upon oneself. Again, back to Everett Ferguson, he says this classic culture was a shame culture as distinct as distinct from a guilt culture. In general, the standard was public opinion. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? 
Honor and shame were group categories. An individual's behavior was judged according to what brought honor or shame on the social group, family, city, religious cult, or associations. The virtues that preserved the order and stability of the society were rewarded with honor, but actions that threatened the values of the community brought reproach, insult, or punishment, depending on their seriousness. So anyone who was shamed could be brought before the governor if it became serious enough to the community. The governor had unlimited power over life and death as long as they did not commit extortion or treason against Rome. The governor was only answerable to the emperor and the senate. So this, call, this caused no small uneasiness in the Christian exiles. You're telling us to put away the ways of our forefathers. <laughs> You're asking me to take on a life of shame here. And possibly I could lose my life, Peter. So... They could be executed, jailed, and in addition, what we have called being canceled, right? This was Rome's cancel culture practices. So how does one face the cancel culture and the retribution of a nation for living for God? Peter says that you must have faith and hope in someone greater than the state someone greater than the creature. You must have hope in someone greater than, it's, than the threats that you are going to receive, someone greater that you love, that you're risk, risking to, that, you, that you're willing to risk all for and not worry about being removed from your social status and privileges. Here Peter says that Jesus Christ was loved or foreknown before the beginning of the world. And he was revealed in these last times for you. And the last times is the end time. We are living in the last days. He was also raised from the dead and received glory. Peter encourages the exiles that Christ is greater than the state. Christ is greater than the governor. And Christ is the one who actually holds the keys to life or death. And no one can shame or cancel Christ. So hide yourself in him by faith with hope and they will not be able to cancel or kill you either, for your life is hidden with God in Christ. John Calvin says this, hope is the anchor of the soul, which enter into the sanctuary, but not without Christ going before us. Faith is our victory against the world, and what is it that makes it victorious? except that Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, has us under his guardianship and protection. Our salvation depends on the resurrection of Christ and his supreme power, faith, and hope. Find here what can support him. Peter remembered when our Lord taught him so uh, Peter remembered when our, when our Lord taught him, when, uh, what the Lord taught him so have no fear of them. This is in Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 to 28. This is our Lord talking. And Peter heard this. He says, so have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whisper, proclaim on the housetops. And Jesus says this, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And Peter remembered when he feared men rather than God, 
when he denied the Lord three times. And this brought him to tears and shame, but he was restored by Christ to honor. Peter himself had to stand against wicked rulers for the truth. His response was one from the Holy Spirit. Do you remember in Acts chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, Peter says this. He says, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So he encourages the exile that Jesus Christ is greater than all. They, we, must not be afraid to honor God above all. Later, Peter writes that we must be subject to all human institution, but he does not mean we are to sin. He is saying that we are to submit to rulers as long as they do not forbid us to do as God commands or to command something that God forbids. We are to pray for our rulers. We are to have respect for our rulers. We are to obey our rulers, but not if they tell us to do something that goes against God. Here's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And notice that fearing God precedes honoring the emperor. So Peter encourages the Christian exile that God is on their side through the person and work of Christ and no one can ever undo what he has done for his people. Well, that moves us to our next point. He tells us to hope in Christ. So how do we hope? You, we, we, there are a lot of people are hoping that this, well, many things. But what does true hope look like? Hope looks like persevering. So Peter's, uh, our next point is persevere in love as a new creation by the living word of God. First Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, it reads, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is grass, and all is glory, like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. So, by now, one may be wondering, how, how can we live like this? I'm very sure the exiles were thinking that. And beloved, there are times and days that I, when I'm reading the Bible, have thought like this. How in the world am I to live like this? How can I be sustained in the hope of Christ's coming? How am I to walk in these unstable and uncertain times? To be honest, in 2020, this was the year I really felt isolated, alone, and those feelings are increasing. And Peter says no to the Christian exile. You are not alone. I don't know who's watching this online. I don't know who will hear this. Maybe you've been sitting in your house. Maybe you stayed away from your family these holidays, through Thanksgiving and Christmas, trying to be a good neighbor and serve your country and serve your city. But in reality, you felt alone. But Peter says, God says, no, you are not alone. 
You have God as your father and you have his church as evidence of his coming. Our connection to one another in the church is not based upon something super, superficial, but upon the work of Jesus Christ. If we are to live in anticipation of Christ's coming, we must persevere in love as a new creation by the living word of God. And this is possible through the great work of, uh, of being born again by the word of God. Peter is saying that salvation is likened to but a greater work of creation. Thomas Watson says, great was the work of creation, but greater the work of redemption. It cost more to redeem us than to make us. In the one, there was but the speaking of a word. In the other, the shedding of blood. The creation was but the work of God's fingers. Redemption is the work of his arm. Beloved, the point here that Peter's trying to make is that your fellow brother and the sisters, your fellow brothers and sisters, the ones that are sitting next to you now, are precious. They are the evidence of the new creation to come. If you ever feel like you're getting off track of looking towards Christ's coming, gather with believers. See, you see, in the beginning, God created the world and put mankind in it. They sinned and ruined the world. Being born again reverses the order. God creates the new man and he bids the darkness to go away by saying, let there be light. In creation, there was no resistance. In regeneration, he used more power because in us there is resistance. The new creation starts on the inside of his people and it is working its way out to renew the world. Peter says this fallen world is disappearing. It is passing away. And beloved, the fact that you're sitting here with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you is evidence of that. This world is passing away and its wicked, its wicked works and its wicked rulers are passing away with it. But you are born again by the word of God will remain. So love the brethren. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it says, honor everyone. And the word for honor means respect. Don't insult. Don't be antagonistic. Respect everyone. But then Peter says, love the brotherhood. He says, show love for the church. And that word for love is agape. It's more than just respecting. It's a cherishing. It's a serving. It's an embracing of the brotherhood. He says to the exiles, take care of one another, for these are the people whom you're going to spend eternity with. Encourage them and love them. Don't turn your back on them. Feed one another. House one another. Encourage one another, cherish one another as if you would cherish your own rib side. First Peter chapter uh, four, verses eight through nine. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And then he addresses the pastors, right? He says in 1 Peter 5, you have a good shepherd here, praise God. But he says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Beloved, today so many churches are worried about how they treat the world because they want to be a good witness. And there's some truth in that, right? I mean, after all, Peter said, honor everyone. 
And we are to do good to those who hate us. However, the best witness to the world is not how we treat them, but how we treat one another. We are to serve and love his people over and beyond what the world does for each other and what we do for the world. Peter remembered the Lord's teaching in John 13, verse 35. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Loving the church is a sign that you are anticipating the Lord's coming. So we must live in the expectation of Christ's coming by preparing our minds, putting aside the futile ways of our forefathers, hoping in, hoping in the God of our salvation, and preserving, persevering, excuse me, persevering in love by the living word of God. And first, when, why should we do this? First Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. You know, I'm going to close. Um, if there is, uh, but I want to close with an example. If there is anyone I can think of that lived in anticipation of the Lord's coming, living as an exile in the earthly kingdom, there was, uh, I think of, um, of course, John Calvin and Edwards and all these great guys come to mind, but you, the person I do think of most is Catherine Parr. Anybody know, you guys know Catherine Parr? She was the last wife of Henry VIII. She was queen of England and a woman who loved the Lord. She would have reformed preaching at the palace and have reformed preachers do Bible studies for her and anyone who want to hear the word of God. And this is what was recorded about her. It is, uh, this writer uh, says this, from all contemporary records, it is evident that she was a true Christian, a lover of God and of his word. One of her chaplains could exclaim, her rare goodness has made every day a Sunday, a thing hitherto unheard of, especially in the royal palace. She surrounded herself with ladies in waiting who shared her spiritual ideals. These high-born ladies spent time studying the scriptures and praying together. And although Henry may well have known what was going on, he chose to ignore it. Through Catherine's influence, evangelical preachers such as Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley were invited to preach both at these private gatherings and before her at Hampton Court. So I'm going to close in, in prayer, but I'm going to close with her prayer. And listen to how this Christian exile anticipates the return of Christ. And I want you to, as you're hearing her prayer, ask yourself, does this describe you, your heart? If so, praise God. If not, then by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you can get there. And ask God to help you start living in the anticipation of the coming of Christ. Let's pray. Oh, when shall the end come of all these miseries? When shall I be clearly delivered from the bondage of sin? When shall I, Lord, have only my mind on you and full be glad and merry in thee? When shall I be free without hindrance and be in perfect liberty without grief or body and soul? When shall I have peace without trouble, peace within and peace without, and on every side steadfast and sure? O oh Lord Jesus, when shall I stand and behold thee and have full sight and contemplation of your glory? When shall you be to me all in all? And when shall I be with you in your kingdom that you have ordained for your elect people from the beginning? I am left here poor as an outlaw, in the land of mine enemies, where daily are battles and great misfortunes. Comfort mine exile, alleviate my sorrow, for all my desire is to be with you, O Lord. It is to me an unpleasant burden. What pleasure whatsoever the world offers me here. I cover to cleave fast to, he to heavenly things, but worldly affections pluck my mind downward. 
Gather, O Lord, my wits and the powers of my soul together in thee and make me to despise all worldly things and by your grace strongly to resist and overcome all motions and occasions of sin. Help me, thou everlasting truth, that no worldly guile nor vanity hereafter have power to deceive me. Come also, thou heavenly sweetness, and let all bitterness of sin flee far from me. Blessed is the person who, for the love of the Lord, sets not by the pleasures of this world and learn truly to overcome themselves with the fervor of with the fervor of spirit and crucifies his flesh. Lord and Holy Father, be blessed now and ever, for as you will, so it is done, and you always will what is best. Amen. Please stand. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Two weeks in a row. There we go. Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living
came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has a Son, Jesus, we have a living hope. Lord, as we celebrate your Son's first advent, as we celebrate uh, his coming to earth, we look forward to when we think of the next advent. And Father, we thank you for the reminder today that we're closer to that time than ever before. Lord, we pray that we would be holy, that we would set aside, that we would hope and persevere. And Lord, as we gather uh, in your name as your church, we know that part of worship is bringing to you our tithes and offerings. And uh, Lord, even though we don't pass the plate, we know that uh, we have a responsibility and, and, uh, and we're called to worship you in that way. Lord, we thank you for uh, what you have given to us and that we can give a portion to you. Through this church, Lord, we pray that your witness would be made to this earth. Lord, as we were reminded this morning of uh, the missionaries that we support, Lord, that we can uh, serve them as they serve us in furthering your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
A song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, again, we want to uh, just thank you for the time uh, sp spending with you all here. And um, thank you for uh, allowing me to come and share the word with you all. And uh, it's been a blessing. Um, the benediction is going to come from Jude. Um, and it reads, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Elizabeth? Oh, well, no. Again, I'm not specific. <laughs> they know the routine. So Sterling, we are uh, grateful that you and your family are part of our family, not only in the uh, Presbyterian Church, but in the Kingdom of God. And we look forward to hearing you again next week. And uh, we thank you for bringing the good word to us this morning. One of the ways that we can tangibly love one another, embrace the church, and be part of this family of believers is through our tithes and our offerings and our gifts. This is the end of the year. If you are inclined to make a year-end gift, we need to have that postmarked by the 31st. If you have it with you today, please make sure it gets in the collection plate at the door. We do thank you for your generosity, and we thank the Lord for his provision to keep this church operating through all these years and even through this difficult year that we've had this year. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Barry is uh, uh, off this week. If anyone has any cares, concerns, needs from the church, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Rose at the office when she's in, or you can uh, call Cal Metz. Uh, primarily will be in the area all week. Um, I will be available. If you have my cell number, you can call me. Uh, we'll be out of town a little bit this week, but you can call me on my cell phone. We will arrange someone to take care of whatever needs you may have if you have them this week. And if we, if we have to call Barry in, we will. <laughs> but he's not that far away. But uh, let's honor him and his family and, and give them a, a break this week. And that's all I've got. Uh, anything else that uh, is worth noting is in your worship folder or in the uh, Harvest Highlights. Please be sure to consult them. <laughs>